Hello, everybody. It's Lori White uh, from the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce, and welcome to episode number 73 of Chamber TV. And today we are talking about a whole variety of issues impacting uh, young folks that are interested in entering the career market. We're talking about entrepreneurship and a few other topics with our very special guest today, Arnell Milhouse. So Arnell, welcome. How are you today? Lori, I am amazingly well. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. I love your positive spirit. So let me just tell you. Uh, our audience a little bit about you and then we can jump right into the conversation. So yeah. currently you are the entrepreneur in residence at Brown University and yes. you also are a prolific uh, founder and startup uh, guru of a number of ventures, uh, including an activity called Career Devs, which you are the CEO of and also a new organization of which you are the CEO, blacklivesbiz.com. So we will be talking about all of those platforms and more and ways that our chamber membership and the local business community can engage in what you are doing and also how we might be able to support and elevate uh, the brands of your various, um, your various programs and platforms and projects so that we can have that for the benefit of all of our members. So we generally start uh, each of our programs by a very simple question. How are you? How are you doing? And how's your family? Ah, great question, honestly. And the family is doing well and I'm doing well. My wife, and myself, we're about to hit 22 years of marriage in September. And my firstborn child is now taller than me, better looking than me, smarter than me, as well as our youngest child as well. And they just, it's just, it's amazing to be able to go through this experience. And, you know, right here in Providence, Rhode Island, where we've all grown up for the past, or they've grown up for the past 17 and 12 years, respectively. And how about yourself? Okay. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. We um, we have been working remotely uh, since March, as most uh, members of the chamber are finding themselves. And uh, we, as a team, have coalesced really well, and we're engaging with our members uh, in ways that we hadn't in the past because we yes. have some new tools and and some new ways and some new reasons why. We, uh, we need to come together in places like this. So it's been really uh, very refreshing, invigorating for all of us. Right, that's, that's great. Great to hear. So tell us, a little bit about, um, tell us a little bit about you and your background and what brought you to Rhode Island and mm -hmm. what, um, what led up to your entrepreneur in residence at Brown University. Absolutely. You know, that's a wonderful question because of late, I've been looking back and connecting the dots and seeing exactly where I am and how I got here. And it's great to follow the breadcrumbs. And I was born in Roxbury, Massachusetts, in Boston. And we were born into a, my siblings and myself, we were born into a lower income family, single mom and working hard. She had a job working in the administration of Mayor White as a executive assistant. And she, hard times befell her. She came out with pneumonia. She was a smoker, had asthma. She lost her left lung. Before we knew it, we were moving from one neighborhood to another neighborhood and each neighborhood was tougher than the next to, to survive in. And after some years, you know, my experience in Boston, it, it really gave you some great street smarts. And I believe entrepreneurship began there in, in, in terms of survival and scaling and doing well. And my mother at one point, she said, you know, it's getting too dangerous here. There was a lot of gunshots, people dying. So she moved us. She put in a move request because we were on government assistance, Section 8 housing, and she moved us out. And we woke up literally seven days later on the seventh hole of the Dennis Pines golf course in Cape Cod. And so it was a culture shock, a change of my world view. And we really didn't like it initially. But over time, I began to see something that was startling for me. In Boston, I noticed that my aunts and uncles were constantly struggling to find work. They were smart, capable of doing the jobs that they were applying for, but they couldn't get the jobs. And, you know, 
it was also interesting. My mother, while she was in Boston, she was working for OIC, helping to train people to get skills and jobs. And that comes full circle in a moment. But, you know, on the Cape, I noticed that no one was struggling. I would go over my friends' houses and I would see refrigerators full of food. I would see Mercedes Benz in their driveways and BMWs in their garages. And, you know, I was in seventh grade at the time. And I hadn't really pieced together the concept of racial inequality. And I would go home, I say, mom, you know, I was over my friend's house and every, everywhere I go, everyone has food and money and they're talking about second houses. And I'm like, how, how is this possible? I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my brain around it. And then we would travel back to see our family and friends in Boston. And it would, it was nothing had changed. Things were getting worse. And I began to feel guilty traveling back and forth between Cape Cod and Boston. And I made my mind up. I said, someday I said, mom, I'm going to do something that's going to make anyone, make it possible for anyone who wants a job to get a job. And no one's going to have to worry about not being able to get a job, not getting hired. And, you know, so then I ended up going to Johnston, Wales originally for a hotel restaurant management because a few years later I had forgotten my vision, but I had stayed in within, I stayed in love with technology from seventh grade. I got into programming, making video games, not just playing them, but creating them. And in high school, taking more rigorous computer science courses. And one of the managers at the restaurant that I worked at, Fred's Turkey House on Cape Cod, it's no longer there, but it was a great, great restaurant. Fred's Turkey. I was, if anyone's ever been there, I was never in the turkey suit outside on Route 28. So if you're wondering, <laughs> that wasn't me. And, but one of the managers there, he was a Harvard graduate and he ran all of the computer science um, aspects of Fred's chain of restaurants. And he convinced me, he says, Arnell, please do not go into a hotel restaurant. He said, please get into, stay, stay with the tech. So I stayed with the tech side. And at Johnston Wales in my freshman year, my mother passed away of her illnesses. And which was a really, really dark time for our life as well. But at the same time, I found myself without any funding, without any money, any ability to stay in school. So I applied for this position at Johnston Wales that was normally set aside for seniors. I applied for it as a sophomore. I got the position and I received a full academic scholarship to pay for my school, my education. Mm -hmm. at, the same time, I, I, at the same time, I got a job with IBM in my sophomore year. And I began to connect the dots and saying, wow, you know, this is really, this is my way out. This is my way into the middle class. And so after graduating college, I got a job with a company called CompUSA. And within my first year of working there, I was making $70,000 a year, blown away. And then my next job with, within the dot-com era, I was making $80,000 a year and I had 25,000 shares of stock. I was receiving stock options. And this is up in Boston and Cambridge. Friends began knocking on my door and they began saying, so I started to out a lot of my friends that were under, un, underemployed or unemployed. And that's really laid the foundations for where we are today. But it, it's looking back at the path, it's, it's an emotional uh, time for me whenever I look back everything that I had to go through to get to where I am now and I and in many ways I feel like the fight is just beginning as you look at the things that are going on nationwide and so I'll turn it back to you in case you want to <laughs> steer it from there yeah no that's you know that's really an amazing story and an amazing trajectory. And it just happens to um, illustrate the importance of a being exposed to mm -hmm. lots of different people, lots of different scenarios. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. also as you encountered um, your mentor, as it would turn out um, yes. at the turkey, uh, the turkey house, right? <laughs> yes, yes. He, yeah. <laughs> uh, but he he said something very profound and, and life changing for you. And it was very simple. He said, hey, don't go into the 
hotel, hospitality, restaurant, management industry, yes. you've got an aptitude for technology and mm -hmm. computer science. So go work on that, go perfect that. So yes. as any, you know, really, really responsible person would do, but it's yeah. sometimes, you know, difficult for us to then actually act on it. You said, okay, you know, here's some advice and I'm going to take his advice and I'm going to, um, you know, go to the next, you know, go to the next level, go to the next step. Yes. So thus you go to Johnson and Wales, you, you enroll in computer science, and then you, you take on those mm -hmm. two opportunities, both, um, you know, working as a professional, um, we, you, I, you said you were a sophomore and you got this full scholarship yes. that only yes. uh, fourth year students generally get in running yes. the computer science lab. And yes. then another opportunity for you to um, engage with students on the retail side and, and right. selling peripherals and the like. So what you right. did, and it's very, you know, it's a great lesson for people that, you know, when someone when someone is about to give you life changing advice, listen. Correct. Absolutely. Indeed. And you've seen the um, so you also through your experiences with your family in Boston have seen the importance of 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 jobs and having someone yes. looking out for you and then Correct. wanting to, you know, now pay it back or pay it forward. Right. So tell us a little bit about how. Um, so we know now we know why and mm -hmm. what what the spirit was that encouraged you to to start mm -hmm. career devs. Tell us a little bit about what that is and um, how students are finding that program working out for them. Absolutely. And, you know, so as a lot of my friends began knocking at my door <laughs> saying, Arnell, you seem to be doing very well. You know, can you help us? I knew that many, many of them were at the end of their ropes struggling financially, and I didn't have four years to sit down with them. So for many of them, I would do a, a compressed and accelerated version of a computer science education that would last either three months, four months, five months, or six months, depending on the individual. But every single one of these people that I worked with, they all received jobs and all received jobs earning. 50, 60, 70,000 dollars a year after just three to six months of me working with them one on one. And so career devs, you know, began in 2017 and I founded it with uh, my amazing business partner, Clifton Shawnier. And he was a former student of mine as well, who was working in a dead end technical support job. I worked with him, gave him some training and he hit it out of the park. And I said, listen, let's, we can do something profound. He's Caucasian, I'm African-American, right? And so it's a great partnership in that sense there. And we wanted to focus on how can we take this compressed and accelerated computer science education concept and do it at scale? How can we innovate the process so that nearly anyone, not just the valedictorians or the 4.0 or the 3.7 students in high schools across the country can enroll in our program. But how can we find the students that didn't test well and create a program that was designed around them? And so we're really big on the, the concept of a Briggs-Meyer type of personality profile. We analyze students as they come in and we understand not just their personality style, but their learning style. And we customize our training to them, but then we do something that is really, really mind blowing. We've gone out to hiring companies and we've asked them, what do they want? What do they want to see in a software engineer? Yep. So and the companies demand driven. demand driven. And every manager that we've ever spoken to, their mind has been blown. They're saying, wait, why are you asking us this? We've met with this school or we've met with that college and no one would do this, but you're coming to us presenting this to us. We would love to work with you. And so for many of the companies, they, per, they pay us a small percentage of the first year salary of a student that they hire from us. And then we design the curriculum 
around the specific needs of the company. They do capstone projects that are enterprise level, full stack, microservice, machine learning, artificial, in, artificial intelligence, packed projects. So that when they join a company on day one, they are workforce ready. Some of the students, they get hired right there in the middle of the interview. They're blowing these companies away. We haven't lost one interview to a student in a traditional four-year college. And we have placed 54, as of this week, 54 out of 56 of our graduates have landed jobs. Mm -hmm. And at Career Devs, it's innovative. We guarantee every graduate a job. If they don't receive a job within six months, they never have to pay us a dime for tuition. It's like a car. I mean, you buy a car. Would you buy a car without a guarantee? Would you buy a microwave or a refrigerator? No, you want a guarantee and the same thing should happen. There's interest free. We don't have any, there's no interest on our loans. There is no loan. And so it's just a, a it's really a kinder, gentler, more guaranteed way of ensuring that any American can access the middle class. And 70%, 70% of Americans earn between $10,000 to $49,000 a year. And that should not be the case in this great nation. It's just a travesty what has happened to our economy and our middle class has been ravaged. And for me, yes, I wanna help African Americans, right? But you'll see that career devs is really the great melting pot. We have students of every nationality. Caucasians, Eastern Indians, Native Americans, African Americans, you name it. And it's great. The, the student that just got a job this week, his name is Nathaniel Quapel. He's an American, African American by way of his parents from Liberia. And he just got a job as a software engineer at Virgin Pulse. And, you know, so it, it's been a phenomenal opportunity. And we've learned to fail fast. And I feel like one thing in Rhode Island, that we need to change. I feel like we, Career Devs hasn't received the reception that I think we would have if we were in Boston, New York, or Silicon Valley. People have said, Arnell, why don't you just operate everything, just move everything to Silicon Valley, come here to New York, what are you doing in Rhode Island? And in, in part, it's true. There's not been one story on Career Devs in any newspaper, right? And yet we've helped 50 people go from 10 to 20 and $30,000 a year to 70, 80, 90, even 120, 130, $140,000 a year. You multiply that 50 times that, and you multiply those 54 people that are all now homeowners here in Rhode Island. Some of them are in Massachusetts, but 90% of them stay here. You know, it, we're having a tremendous impact on the state. And now we're able to scale. And in this environment of COVID, 40% of the jobs are not coming back, Lori. You know these numbers. 40% right. of the jobs are not coming back. And Career Devs is the best suited organization to do this at scale. We're all online now. So people can take the training anywhere. It's only three days a week. And it's so I think I might be on my soapbox a little bit. But no, I know. No, uh, yeah. But I. I want to uh, I want to hear more about it, and I'm glad that you've come on Chamber TV to tell us about career devs, and hopefully we can help um, tell the story of what you're doing and and get employers involved as well as yes. potential students for you. So let's just unpack that a little bit more. So yes. the program is headquartered in Providence, is that right? Yes. Yes. It okay. Is. Okay. So um, somebody's watching this program right now, potentially mm -hmm. an employer. Um, and by the way, there's tremendous um, demand in the computer science, software engineering field, as you well know. So, you know, it's, it's interesting that there's great demand for this talent and then also great demand to be able to place um, students, upcoming students right. in jobs. Right. So it's, you know, it's really a natural, a natural mm -hmm. fit. So the key is, as you say, to, um, to scale it up. So. Why don't you um, tell us a little bit about if you're, if, you know, if an employer, potential employer right now is is watching this interview, um, what can they, how can they interact with you and, and your students? 
Absolutely. So first of all, if they would like to, they could call, they could give a call to Citizens Bank. They could call anyone at Virgin Pulse. They can call anyone at eMoney, any of the managers there for references. And they'll, I know that we're receiving glowing reviews from those companies. There are a lot, there are many other companies as well, Amazon up in Boston and many other corporations in Rhode Island. But those are our three that I, that come, that are top of mind. And, but they can reach out to me directly. It's Arnell at career d e v s dot com arnell at careerdevs.com and i would love to be able to have a conversation to show them how they could really meet their hiring quota for talented associate level and junior level software engineers and you know it, it's it makes it a breeze because we really work with corporations to find out where is their technical debt what is their particular technology stack? And our students come out algorithmically strong, computational, computational thinkers, and they're great problem solvers, more so than adhering to any one specific language, even though they have absorbed Java, C Sharp, Python, JavaScript, all of the, the usual suspects, but they're, they're great problem solvers. And they're self-starters, self-sufficient, driven. And we do a lot of uh, we focus a lot on self-identity, emotional intelligence, and growth mindset thinking. And you should see the transformation in people's lives. We had a little meeting, a meetup, about seven of us last night, students that have just graduated and some that are about to graduate. And the maturity, the growth that these people, and they, these are people that are 25, 35, and 45 years old. It's not, these aren't teenagers, but people that have just been stuck. And so we would love to speak with any company that is interested in hiring amazing software engineers. Okay, so let's look at the program from a different vantage point and mm -hmm. let's look at from the um, from the vantage point of the enrollee. So yes. give us a, a little bit of a flow chart as, as to how someone comes into your, uh, into your universe and what happens to them over a six month period. So tell us, tell us a story about one of your students. Absolutely. So yeah, the persona of the prototypical career dev student is someone who's probably working a job, maybe working two jobs, full-time job, part-time job. It could be a single parent, could be a single dad, could be just an individual. And when they go to careerdevs.com, they click the enroll button. And after they click enroll, they'll receive an opportunity to enroll into an assessment phase, which is about anywhere from two to four weeks of work that we will pre-work, that will give these potential students. And during that time, they fill out an assessment. They do a personality assessment as well, where we're able to analyze their learning style and analyze, analyze their self view as well. What, how do they view their own human potential? And we have an HPI, human potential index score that we give every individual student that signs up. And that helps us to understand what it's going to take for this individual. Will they be able to succeed in this program? Because it is fairly rigorous. We teach some Harvard University curricula so it becomes fairly heady, man. But we believe that anyone with a human brain can get there. And after that assessment phase is over, we'll know if a person can continue and we'll let them know, well, you're, you've been accepted or maybe you should continue working on this material and we will work with you. And maybe in another four months, we can have you enroll. But we also look at this schedule, which is a major, major challenge because a lot of people, they're, if they're working two jobs or they have children, it's, that's a major factor for us. And so we try to help them work out their schedule. But then once they're in the program, it's, it's usually a, it's smoother sailing. It's smoother sailing. And because if you can get past the assessment phase, then you can get through the program. Usually if a student drops out, it's because some life emergency happens, crops up. And so... That's how we onboard and bring th people through the program. 
So are you actually d- yourself doing the training or do you have a team of trainers and trainers, yes. training trainers, or give us a little mm-hmm. bit of, um, of a point of view about the, the back end of your operation? Yes. So we do have a team of trainers and educators, instructors that are teaching it. And we, every one of our instructors, we have four in total right now. And we have a, several part-time instructors that everyone has graduated or have got, has gone through the career devs program. And so that's one of the requisites. And so some of the people have graduated and they're working at other companies and they'll come in and they'll teach a course from time to time. But for our core instructors, everyone has gone through the program and I am an instructor as well. I handle the in, the intro cohort and right. I, I, and we're working on right now with someone to begin replacing me. I'm doing less and less instruction now and yeah. because I feel that that is an important time and sometimes you can be really, really geeky but not have the bedside manners to yeah, help. It's your job to infuse hope, right? Yes. And confidence yes, yeah. and yes. inspiring and you know, yeah. that kind of, you know, uh, leadership potential, just kind of Correct. drawing that out of people. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't take much, right, to, to be able to, you know, be able to do inspire something someone. and inspire somebody and offer hope. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so it's a six month program, pretty 12 much. months. So it's a 12 month program. Yes. And if you include the, the assessment phase, it could, you could say that it's 13, 13 months, but yes, typically it's 12 months. And are you finding equal uh, representation, female and male? Yeah, so we have 40% female attendance in, in, in our school and 30% people of color, which is phenomenal. When you look at the industry standards for those, it's I believe 7% female and 4% people of color in the industry. So we're really, hitting it out of the park and people, um, it, you know, seeing that impact, especially if there it's women or people of color who in their wildest dreams never imagined that they would be earning $80,000 a year in this field doing this. It's, it's, it's a rewarding, awarding career already for us, everyone in career devs. Well, the demand is only likely to grow. And as you mentioned, the idea that um, you want to scale it up, and that's what you're doing right now because you also, as an entrepreneur, is uh, likely to do um, off to thinking about other projects where you can um, provide a solution for a vexing business issue. So why don't we transition at this point to your... Um, so you are so, other. Yes. So before we do that, I do. I, I want to make sure I put a put a a pin in this one here. That for Rhode Island, our state, our, post COVID, if we ever reach a post COVID time, we're going to undergo a, a very, very, very challenging time. And there are too many people that are in the state that are gonna be left behind. So I really want to raise our hand here at Career Dev and say that please, if you have anyone that you know that wants to have a future-proof, a COVID-proof career, please sign up for Career Devs. We welcome you with open arms and we guarantee that everyone that comes to our doors will get a job paying a minimum of 50, but usually between 70, 80, and $90,000 a year. So. I just I wanted to really make sure that we mm-hmm. we ended on that point there because it's too important Absolutely. for our state. Right. Absolutely. So if you're just joining us, we are talking with Arnold Milhouse, who is the CEO of Career Devs. He is an entrepreneur in residence at Brown University and also the CEO of another startup platform called BlackLivesBiz.com, which we will um, begin talking about in just a moment. But uh, we're speaking about uh, biz, uh, biz devs, no, not biz devs, career devs. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and um, tell us uh, one more time how to reach um, how to reach you, Arnell. It is Arnell, A R N E L L, at career, D E V S dot com. 
arnell at koreadevs.com. Okay. So let's move on to another thing that you're very passionate about yes. and the Black Lives Matter movement and specifically how, um, again, it's, it's much of the same sort of foundational thinking about how to um, provide self-sufficiency. This time, um, your target audience is uh, business professionals and business owners. So um, give us a flavor of uh, your additional project, please, Arnell. Absolutely. So again, it's, you mentioned something about having different experiences and conversations. So we feel great about what we've been doing on the career side of things, helping people get become gamefully employed. But as we began speaking to business owners who said, Arnell, you know, this is, I feel like this business is my calling. I want to do this, but our business is struggling. And one thing that's interesting is that you look at the concept of PPP, right? The, the, the funding, the government support that was given to corporations, small businesses and large businesses nationwide. One of the requ requirements to receive the PPP is that you had to have more than one employee. But nationwide, 96% of businesses owned by African-Americans have zero employees. They're sole proprietorships. And those businesses are the backbone of the black community. So 96% of those businesses never receive any of the PPP funding. And 95% of business transactions that take place from an internet search are based upon the businesses that are on the first page of Google, Bing, or Yahoo. You have to show up on the first page, yet less than 1% of black owned businesses show up on the first page of Google, Bing, or Yahoo. And, you know, it's the same thing. I go, you know, for myself, I guess, okay, you know, and I've realized that I've been this entrepreneur all my life. I love looking at a process and fixing it. So we created a website called blacklivesbiz.com and we made it free for businesses to join. They can upload a profile, a photo, and information about their business. You go there and now you can search. You can say, okay, show me all of the black owned businesses in Providence, in Newport. Wow, wait, yes, there are black owned businesses in Newport. Who would have known? So you can go to Black Lives Biz and find that. You can do a search for Boston. You can do a search for Poughkeepsie. You can look for Los Angeles, California, any state, any city in the country, you can do a search now on Black Lives Biz. And so right now in phase one, it was simply a directory listing. And when we launched the business, we had 250 businesses just in and around Providence, Rhode Island. Within three weeks, we grew to 9,000 businesses nationwide. How and now, you, uh, as, how did you do that? So one, it's been a viral, it has been a viral movement because, you know, one of the great tenets and things that I learned, you know, through my experience in entrepreneurship and Danny Warshe at Brown University, my mentor, he, he always says, build things that people want, create something that people need, right? There should be a hair on fire, desire, for whatever you're building. And we've caught that wave for sure because black business is saying they want to be found because right now there are like trees that fall in the middle of the woods that no one's there to see or hear. Does that tree really exist? So now we have this opportunity. So we've grown, our Facebook group has grown to 3000 people in just three weeks, over 3000. Right now we're pushing 4,000. And so it's a viral phenomenon. And as of, this afternoon, we'll have 60 to 65,000 businesses nationwide on Black Lives Biz. So you look at the scale, right? From 200 to 6,000 to 60,000. And the next phase for Black Lives Biz is to create an e-commerce portal where every business owner is gonna be able to use their phone 
to upload images of their products or services. Maybe they're a yoga studio. They can schedule appointments and the e-commerce transactions can happen right there on Black Lives Biz. They get the lion's share. We take a small portion. It's it's a for-profit, but we really, it's sort of like we have a double bottom line for Black Lives Biz. I mean, that's how we're keeping the lights on, paying the bills. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention our amazing partners that we have in CIC, where I, <laughs> which is where I'm presenting from right now. You know, Rebecca Weber here at CIC and the entire team yep. have been incredible partners for for Black Lives Biz and for career devs and for so many things that we're doing, they're really putting their money where their mouth is. They care about the community. They see the climate in this country and they're stepping up. Also, RyHub. RyHub has been amazing and has been a champion of mm -hmm. this, as well as the Nelson Center at Brown. They both, RyHub and Brown, and the Nelson Center, went out and helped us get to gain um, free hosting for the website. Right, and there's so many ways. It takes a village, and I am proud of the village that has come around and to form Black Lives Biz, and the founding team that we have here in Rhode Island is an all-star cast. We have Georgina Sarpong, who's well known throughout the the community farming, the the community, the Saturday, the Saturday on um, what do they call them? The, community business pop-ups events that take place in the different locations. And we also have Kobe Dennis, who needs no introduction. He ran for mayor. Mm -hmm. We have yeah, Branford no Davis. Kobe. Yes, Kobe. And we have Branford Davis of the um, the John Hope Settlement House. And we have just great, a great, great, great leadership team that is really pushing this agenda forward. And now we're scaling and expanding nationwide to bring a voice. So if anyone is interested, because you see the Black Lives Matter signs everywhere, right? On, I live on the east side and I see them on the lawns and I am encouraged to see them. It's a breath of fresh air. And now, but a lot of the business owners have said, you know, the, the sentiments are great because they are, it's wind beneath your wings. But they said, people don't know about this business. Right. How can they find out about us? And so that's right. what Black Lives Biz is. So now if anyone wants to support a black owned mm -hmm. business, they can search online and they can frequent that business. They can go to that business. Well, it's like pent up demand, if you think about it, because right. people want to support the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but question of like, what is the best way to do that? Right. And, and so and instead of just making a donation, now you can go directly to the source, right? Because normally if you donate it to one organization that filters it out, that's one way of doing it. But in one of the things that we're adding, we are adding a donate, biz, a donate button where you'll be able to donate to any business that you want to. So now you can have a more direct impact, no middlemen. We get 0% of donation money that comes into the site. So we're really thinking of ways that people can have, because we've asked businesses, hey, you know, this organization has in Providence has received fifty thousand dollars in donations, and they say we haven't seen any of it. Where is it going? How is it being used? How is it? It's not coming to the south side. It's not impacting the community. Mm -hmm. So this is a way, and you know, and we've also partnered with. I, I would be remiss if I mentioned Reba. Lisa Wrangland has also been a great partner as well, and that's another organization that people can go to. So between. It's just been a great seeing Providence come together in this way. Tell us a little bit about some of the local businesses that are part of um, your platform. Absolutely. So I think of uh, um, Banneker Industries, right? Junior Jabby, they're a part of it. I think of the district, which is a restaurant right here, right down the street from us here in, in the jewelry district. And there is a wonderful restaurant that we've discovered called Afrique de Lounge. It's on Dean Street, right off of Atwell's Avenue, and it has the most amazing African food, along with other African restaurants such as Glorious. And it, it, there's so many, there's uh, Glow Juice Bar, which is off of Admiral Street. There are lawyers, 
there are plumbers and doctors and dentists that you can find. Who knew? I didn't even know we had black doctors or dentist offices here in Rhode Island myself. And I'm discovering new businesses. It's just amazing. Every day I go there and I scroll through the list of businesses and I'm blown away by the companies that are actually adding themselves there. And it's a, you know, there's Tilt Communications, which is run by Tony Lopes. And he was a former head of Seven Swords Media, which was a spin out of that. But there are also businesses in Boston, Norman Construction. There's um, Sarcastic Sweets, which makes the most delicious desserts and sweets. There are farms, abundance farms, community farms in the neighborhood. And, but there are Garden of Eve, which is a Caribbean style food restaurant, which I love. And I mean, I, Bucktown, who knew that Bucktown had a, an owner that was African-American? There are so many. I could go on there, on and on and on and on and on. I'm looking at the list right now as I'm scrolling. Mixed Magic Theater. Do we have five hours worth of time, Lori? Because we I could remember, keep going. I remember Mixed Magic Theater. Absolutely. Yeah, so, yes. So, um, so folks are in, so if you're, if you believe that, um, you would like to be included in blacklivesbiz.com. So somebody's watching right mm -hmm. now, they, yeah. um, they want to get involved. So they, it's, it's free to join. So you just go and then you upload, mm -hmm. um, photos and your business story, contact information, special yeah. offers, um, things of that nature, and you are able to be part of your nationwide platform. And so people, theoretically, if they're in California and they want to do business with someone Absolutely. in Rhode Island, but they want to um, do it through um, the Black Lives Biz mm -hmm. um, you know, overall structure, they could just log on and they could find somebody in that particular category. Right. Correct. And here's something that's interesting as well. The site, blacklivesbiz.com, it was created by myself, my business partner, Cliff, and our, our newest business partner, Gabe, who was a longtime associate and student of mine since the age of 15. Now he's 19, and he's one of the lead instructors at Career Devs and a group of students at Career Devs. And it, it's also amazing because the mix of nationalities on that team is amazing. It's not just all black students that said, hey, I want to work on that. We have white mm -hmm. students that said, hey, yes, I want to. I want people to know that this is and we're going to have a team profile page up there soon. But mm -hmm. the career dev students built that site. And it's just a phenomenal way of one hand washing the other. And it's a win win. We like to say mm -hmm. it takes a village. Man. Yeah. So you're all working out of the Cambridge Innovation Center. Uh, well, they're Dyer working Street. out of home. They work out of home from okay. time to time. A few of them will come here. We do have the Black Lives Biz office here and yep. in partnership with CIC, you know, and that's amazing. It's like you swap right on how we have an office and what we're doing, we're able to bring companies in and talk about local design, talk about branding, talk about e-commerce, talk about messaging, talking about customer personas. And this is things that, you know, and, and they, they come to this building, they come to the CIC building and you see just their jaws drop and they go, wow. And I go, and they're like, wow, we didn't know something this amazing existed in Providence. So, yeah. so you're doing coaching too. You're not just, you know, putting people's web pages up. You're saying, Hey, come on in. Let's talk about what your unique value proposition is as a business. Who's yeah. your target audience? Um, how, what's the best way to reach, you know, the target audience? What, how do you search engine optimize right. their own, you know, their own back end? So you're actually providing some pretty serious business consulting services on top right. of everything else. Right. Um, in addition to the communications platform. Yes. Can I tell you a secret? Sure. I'm basically taking my entrepreneur and resident office hour role and I'm making it available to communities of color in Providence right. here at CIC. And yeah. so I'm doing the same thing that I would normally do with students at Brown, but we're doing that here in the community. So everything that I've learned from Brown and everything that I've learned through my own experience, we're doing exactly what you just said. 
before we move on to um, what it means to be an entrepreneur in residence at Brown, um, I wanted to mm -hmm. give you an opportunity, as you said during the last segment, to put a pin in it and to summarize um, what your major theme is relative to how people can view the importance of, of this particular website and portal. Yes. You know, we have 10 minutes left. Oh boy, I'm, I'm gonna try to keep this at 60 seconds because this is hard. When, as, I, as I was talking about my experience when I was younger, traveling back and forth between Cape Cod and Roxbury, Cape Cod and Roxbury and seeing the, the dichotomy the chasm that existed, it was 60 miles difference, but it might as well have been different planets, different worlds. I realized that African Americans, we've been living functionally under duress. And I'm like, I say, I think, I'm like, wait, I think that we might have PTSD. I might have gone through traumatic experience. I'm saying this even now as I think, because economically we're disenfranchised. If you look at what's happening with the NBA, the NHL, and all these other teams and players that have walked off and says, we're not playing anymore. It's like being in an abusive relationship with someone that you love. We love this country. I love America. We do. But Something has to give. You know, I was reading an article in the New York Times how 90% of homes owned by African Americans are appraised for 30 to 40% lower value. And one woman, she was she was in a mixed relationship. Her husband was white. She had to take all of the pictures of everyone in the family of color down and just leave the pictures of her white husband up and leave the house and have another appraiser come in. And then it was appraised for the full value. There are systemic issues in this country that people, that pr our president doesn't believe exist. Even here in Rhode Island, we have biases that people that are just, and for African Americans, we, we're functioning within this systemic environment. And we're just really coming to grips with how bad it is. It's like waking up, and you're in triage, but yet you still have to work. You have to go to your, throughout your day-to-day -day life, even though you're in the OR and there's triage being performed on you. So Black Lives Biz, it's a drop in the ocean that we need. And climate change, it's like we've been experiencing a form of racial climate change for the past 400 years, Lori. And we, we have to do something and it's coming to a head when we're not asking for handouts, we don't want that. We simply want to read the constitution and know that it's going to be distributed fairly, that those words, uh, that I'll be able to wrap myself in that flag. The reason people kneel is because we cannot wrap that flag equally around our body, it doesn't provide the same protection for African-Americans as it does for Caucasian-Americans. And so it's so much bigger than just Black Lives Biz. What we're experiencing is heartbreaking. It is emotionally heartbreaking. We're fighting for equality in a nation that is at the pinnacle of economic achievement and scientific achievement. GPS was created by an African-American woman. There's so many achievements and things that we've contributed to the society. We have to make Thank a change. We, we have to do better. We have to do better. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I think now's a good time to to probably end it, even though I would love to talk about what I'm doing at Brown and the opportunity that we're, we have there. But yeah, I wasn't expecting that, but. Well, we can talk a little bit about yes, Brown. Yes, we can, um, yes. And, um, you know, I have, we've had some wonderful experiences with the Nelson Center. Mm -hmm. um, 
we uh, at the chamber um, over the years have developed some um, entrepreneurial uh, capacity in trying to showcase why Providence, why Rhode Island is a great place for uh, talent to come, to grow a business, and to really um, attach themselves to universities and colleges that have the yes. entrepreneurial spirit. So in that sense, um, we've uh, We've worked closely yes. with Danny Warshe mm-hmm. and yes. uh, a, a bunch of, uh, you know, the team over there. Yes. Uh, I just read where the, 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 I know the Nelson Center has um, obviously a, a beautiful new headquarters, but now it's yes. going to go virtual. And right. we've, uh, yeah, so we've, um, we've done a lot of projects with them, cross promoting and, and the like. So um, how is it that, um, you know, how is it that you like to, um, contribute to what the Nelson Center is doing? What is, um, what, what special talents do you want to bring to them? You know, so it's been a full year now that I, since I began my residency there at, at Brown. And the first three years, was, it, it consisted of a lot of mentorship from Danny, from Jonas, from Jason Harry, and the rest of the team there. I was coming in, speaking with students, but learning sitting there being a fly on the wall and learning the way that they help the students discover unmet needs and bring them to market and scale them. And Brown has done such an amazing job and really kudos to Jonathan Nelson of Providence Equity, who gave a, a generous, generous donation to get this entire process rolling. And it's, for myself over the past year, meeting with student after student has helped to create a shortened distance between a, a billion connected dots where I'm now, I have a greater cadence and frequency and being able to sit down with a student, s- listen to them and help them and elucidate the best practices that they should, that they should take. And it's really, it's myself and we have another entrepreneur in residence. Her name is Laura. She's on the West Coast in Silicon Valley. And you know, the entire team, though, there's so many people in the Nelson Center now community that are contributing week to week to grow the entrepreneurial community. But it's not just for Brown. So much of it is spilling out into Providence. I know that Pangea, Adam, his company, they've hired students from Johnson and Wales and, and, and Bryant College. And these are companies that are being started right here. And as well, Brown has been really, really open to the career devs community and also to the Black Lives Biz community, inviting those business owners to participate in their now virtual events. But back then, their physical events as well. So mm-hmm. Brown has really stepped up their leadership role and mm-hmm. reaching out into the community and having an impact on Providence in as a whole in the state as well, the state at large. It must be very gratifying uh, for you when you're working with students to be able to share something with them and then see the light go off in yes. their own minds and you say, yes, you know, absolutely reach them. And, and then it just blossoms from there. Right. And I see some of the companies that I have received funding. Some of them have received a half a million. Some of them received multiple in multiples and saying, wow, you know what? I am sitting down with them and yes, you know, they love some of my advice and I was able to give them some tidbits that help them get to where they are. So it, it's been a phenomenal, phenomenal opportunity to think about this kid from Roxbury by way of Cape Cod now as an entrepreneur in residence at Brown University and sitting here having a conversation with the great and amazing Lori White. Well, we've enjoyed our time together um, so much, and we're getting some questions coming in. Um, I see a question from David. How do I get in contact with you, Arnell? So yeah. I think you- uh, I, I think I have an opportunity right here in the chat window to- Yeah. And I'm even going to do something here. I'm gonna put my cell phone number. Please send me a text message first and foremost. Those are the two best ways to get in contact with me. All right, I'm going to take a screenshot myself so that I can make Absolutely. sure that I know exactly 
how to reach you firsthand. Right. So yeah, we're all, you know, we're all learning together, right? We're mm -hmm. all practicing and, you know, trying to adopt new ways of doing business and stay connected with one another. So that's one of the, the yes. great things about, um, you know, this kind of work is that we can all be supportive um, to Correct. each other's efforts. So what um, what can we do at the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce, Arnell, to to um, elevate your work? Before I let you go, I can't, yes. I can't I think let you go before yeah. I ask you, yeah. what can we do for you? I think Anything? you've done it here. I think you've done it here, but continuing to promote the initiatives, Career Devs and BLB, if you could put that up on your website, I think that would be amazing and wonderful. The fact that you showed up, they say that community is whoever shows up, right? I mean, Laura, you showed up here today and gave us a platform to address. And again, it's not just African-Americans, but there's so many Rhode Islanders that are benefiting from career devs. And so many Caucasians that are thanking me for Black Lives Biz, saying, hey, thank you, because I would have never known. And now I get to do something more than just put a post on social media. So mm -hmm. continue okay. to spread the word. Fan it into flames. Thank you. OK. <laughs> Well, thank you for spending part of your day uh, with us, Arnell. We've really enjoyed it. And um, this is episode number 73 of Chamber TV. So I hope that you will uh, share this episode with all of your constituents and stakeholders Absolutely. and people in your community. And uh, we'll continue to hopefully through this effort, find uh, new folks that we can showcase and talk to and learn from and share with mm -hmm. and uh, go forward in that same spirit of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial thinking that you've outlined so beautifully for mm -hmm. us today. So Arnell, thank you. And thank you so much. We, we will see you soon. See you soon. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you for everyone for tuning in. Bye-bye. Thank you.